It is um, 7 p.m. Uh, Chicago time, so we will get started. Good evening to everyone. I'm Ajit Sachdeva, and I'm the director of the Division of Education at the American College of Surgeons. And I also have the distinct uh, pleasure and privilege of co-chairing the steering committee of the ACS Academy of Master Surgeon Educators, along with Dr. L.D. Britt. This evening, we are really privileged to have with us uh, Sir Murray Brennan as our fireside discussant. And we are in for a real treat this evening. Uh, uh, Dr. Shabahang, who moderates these sessions, will formally introduce uh, Murray Brennan. But I'll just mention that uh, um, uh, Dr. Brennan is a founding member of the Academy, also on the steering committee of the Academy, and he also chairs the International Outreach uh, Subcommittee of the Academy. So we are so delighted to have him with us to share his experiences and his wisdom this evening. Uh, Dr. Shabahang, as I mentioned before, is going to moderate the session. He each time does a fantastic job. And uh, Dr. Shabahang is the CMO and the chief of the surgical service line uh, within the WellSpan system, which is a big healthcare system in central Pennsylvania. Before I turn the floor over to Mo, I'm going to also thank our wonderful staff, uh, Dr. Lisa Nagler, uh, Ms. Susan Newman, uh, and Mr. Steven Samalchik, who you know very well. Uh, they are the ones who correspond with you regularly uh, from the Academy uh, and send you all the messages. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Olivier Petinu, our Assistant Director for e-learning uh, within our division who is providing technical support. So thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to a very, very engaging and an interesting session. And over to you, Dr. Shabahang. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sajdeva. Um, Thank you all for joining. Uh, this has been, this is uh, an amazing showing. I see signs from Argentina and from Nepal. Um, so it's really exciting to have such a wide audience from around the world. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Obviously, um, uh, we're really excited about uh, having Dr. Brennan as our, and, and I see Bogota, Colombia, having Dr. Brennan as our, as our panelist for the fireside chat. Uh, before uh, I go into the discussion, if I, um, I think we're gonna have a slide. Um, and uh, just as far as housekeeping, if you would like to ask a question, please just use the, 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 the reactions on the Zoom and just raise a hand and uh, we will make sure you ask the question. Or if you're more comfortable, please put it in the chat box and I'll make sure to ask the question. So uh, for that, and we're gonna have an evaluation, I think at the end. Um, so those are all the housekeeping things. Um, we also want to let you know, if you haven't seen it on the Academy uh, webpage, we always have all the fireside chats and all the named lecture and all the grand rounds. The recordings are there for you at any point if you want to use it. Just a few announcements about future programs. We have our grand rounds on March 17th. Uh, it will be um, uh, the same panelists as our January um, grand rounds, uh, Dr. Sadawi from George Washington, Dr. Sosa from UC San Francisco, and Dr. Mikolasi uh, from uh, Cornell. Um, we are, um, this will be more about the, the value proposition of surgical education. So please join us. And also Dr. Atala will be our panelist for the fireside chat in April. So thank you very much, Olivier. Um, uh, so tonight it's really an honor and a pleasure um, to introduce uh, Dr. Brennan. I, I think Dr. Brennan doesn't need that introduction, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do the introduction through asking Dr. Brennan about uh, his career. Uh, we're just gonna have a conversation. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please just use the raise hand uh, function on, chat, on the Zoom. And if you would rather put your question in the chat box, please do so and we'll make sure to ask it. 
And if you don't ask any questions, I'll keep asking the questions. So, so welcome, Dr. Brennan. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I was just, uh, com- you know, um, just uh, talking about my memory as a surgical oncologist interviewing a Sloan Kettering in 1999, and, and, I, and I was mentioning that to Dr. Brennan. So this is a real treat for me to have the honor of interviewing, uh, interviewing you tonight. I was gonna start by just asking you about your career and the path that it took um, uh, from the beginning in New Zealand and how you ended up where you were. So um, uh, if I could start with a general question like that. Well, I'm I'm at no surprise, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to point out to you that I was told this was a fireside chat. And so I took off my tie only to see Shabahang with a jacket and tie and I must admit, for the first time in my life, seeing Ajit Sachdeva without a jacket. So <laughs> I'm actually sitting in my office uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. But as I was told it was a fireside chat, I took the liberty uh, the other evening, Sunday night, sitting at my house out in Westchester to actually take a picture of the fire. So this is the fire we had last Sunday sitting in front of it. Um, so I took it seriously as a fireside chat and I don't sit in front of the fire without, uh, with a jacket on. So now I'll answer your question. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, where did I start? Well, obviously I was born in New Zealand. I was very fortunate to, uh, I suppose, end up in the United States because I didn't get a Rhodes scholarship and ended up with a consolation prize here at the time of the Vietnam War. That was an interesting experience because we came uh, as uh, what was called student leaders. I was the president of the the student union and the US government decided that they would take 13 people from around the Pacific, Korea, Japan, um, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and they would bring us here. And we didn't really realize that the design was to um, prove that the Vietnam War was a good thing. And we'd go back and convince all of our people in the university that that was true. Unfortunately, we became a little cynical. And so we would go to these various places like the Experiment in International Living or the Peace Corps or the University of Chicago. And we'd put on these debates for and against the uh, Vietnam War. And there were 13 of us and we had two matchboxes, six green heads, six red heads and one yellow. If you got the yellow, you didn't have to debate. You got the green, you were for, you got the red, you were against. And we would get up and debate. It taught me an extraordinary lot about what was going on in the United States. But more importantly, it taught me a very important lesson. I went back and someone said, well, you've been there. Now you have to tell the entire student union what you think about the Vietnam War. And I said, which side would you like me to be on? And they said, no, no, no. We want to know what you think. And that was a great education because I didn't know what I thought. And that was the start of recognizing that finding the um, truth is extraordinarily difficult. We all indulge ourselves in... um, in confirmation bias, but that was an amazing lesson for me, which I still struggle with. So that was the start. I would have, under normal circumstances, had I got the roads, I would have been in UK and never come to this great country. I then went back there and um, Francis Moore, who was the Mosley professor uh, at the Brigham, came as a visiting professor. I was single and I got to shuttle him around. And he said, well, what are you going to do in the next year? And I said, I was going to San Francisco. I had a job working with Tom Hunt, who was a wound healing guy. And he said, well, you can't do that because there's no good medical schools outside Route 128. You'll need to come to Boston. Um, And Andy would appreciate that. That would be the way he talked. So I ended up in Boston initially as a research fellow and then as a resident. The story is getting too long. Should we change the question? Well, you know, actually, uh, the question I was going to get to, and I just want to point out, this is so exciting to see Australia, Taiwan, uh, this is a pretty amazing audience. Um, 
what were some of the forks in the road in your career? You, you know, I, I think I, I definitely want to ask you about the start of a career and advice about that, but also uh, we're, we'll get to retirement and 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 the and and kind of the latter parts of the career. But what were some of the forks in decision making? You just alluded to one. And one of the questions that you know one always asks is how intentional are the forks and how much are they just happenstance? Um, and, and again, I think you you already kind of mentioned one of them, but but what were some of the major forks in your career and your path? Well, once I was here, um, it was wasn't too difficult. Um, and of course I found my wife at the Brigham, so that made it even more complicated. Um, the Dr. Moore had a sort of assistant, and it was usually a foreign graduate who lasted about a year or two and then disappeared into the woodwork. And so he suggested that rather that I should do that. And I said, well, that wasn't going to work for me. I was single and I, I, I'd go somewhere else. Maybe I'd go to the UK. And he literally created a position a categorical position in the residency. Um, when I said, listen, the only reason I'm gonna stay here is if I can do the boards. Those of you who knew him, he would say, that's not possible. There's no way you can do that. And I was naive enough to say, okay, well, I'll find something else. And then he changed his mind. And uh, then I met my wife who was an intern, or I guess at that time. And so I, I was there, there for good. The forks in the road bit, um, is an interesting one. I don't think I've ever set out with an intent to be somewhere. I've tended to believe that if you do a good job today, tomorrow will take care of itself. And yesterday's already gone and you can only learn from it. You can't go back and change it. So yes, there were a lot of fortuitous changes. Uh, when it came to join the staff at the Brigham, I knew after residency, I would never be able to uh, demonstrate that I could do it alone. And that was why I went to the NCI with Steve Rosenberg, who was a co-resident with myself. And that was a very good decision. Um, more or less or stop or go. If, if there are others, please share. Well, no, the, the, the next big reason, of course, is why would you leave the NCI? I mm -hmm. felt that I had proven my, that I could do it. I had my own lab. Uh, I had a great clinic. I had too big a clinical practice, mainly doing complex endocrine surgery, very complicated endocrine surgery. And of course, remember at the NCI, you do it alone. You have a what amounts to a second year resident. So w there's no one there to help you. So you learn perhaps the wrong way, but you certainly learn to deal with very complicated cases. I basically left because I was too busy clinically. Mm. I love the place, uh, but there's no point in being at the NCI if you're just operating four days a week. That's the exact wrong thing to do. My wife was from New York, and so when I was asked to come to New York, that was a good decision for me. Three of my children were born in Washington. The first was born at the Lying Inn in, in, in Boston. In and then finally, the final piece, of course, is... I came never wanting to be a chairman, ever. That was a bad idea. But as many will know, you take jobs for two re reasons. You either want them or you don't want someone else to have them. So when Jerry DeCoste resigned under duress, I thought I, I'm not secure enough not to be a candidate. And so that's how I became chairman. And as it turned out, for me, that was a wonderful decision. And I would love to go back to the to the time. Obviously, you know, for many, you're identified with Memorial Sloan Kettering, but you mentioned something about being chair. And what is the best leadership advice you received um, through your career? What are some of the best? Uh, and I and I'm going to ask you eventually. Obviously, what advice you would give? But I first want to know wh wh when was it that someone gave you a great piece of advice about leadership? Uh, I don't think many people gave me a lot of advice. I, I tended to have to work it out for myself. It's no secret, I think, if I'd known what I was getting myself into, I would never have come to Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm delighted I came, but had I known 
what I was going to encounter those first two or three years, there's no chance in hell I would have come. May uh, I ask you to elaborate on that? Well, how do you do this politely? Uh, okay, I'll reserve any critical comments for those that are already dead and, and save the ones for those that are still alive. <laughs> It was basically had been a very private practice place. Uh, I mean, um, people like Brunschweig and Pack, who operated on Eva Peron, they were private practitioners. And their philosophy was the exact opposite of what I had believed in. And that is that, you know, you're in charge, you dominate everything, you, quote, eat what you kill. And it was in the process of changing to a geographically and academic full time. But there were still people here who lived and believed in the old model. One of the very senior surgeons told me shortly after I arrived that did I understand at my age, he didn't have a practice. And did I understand that only he and I would take out the pancreas. And so I had a start by beginning, no, that's not how I'm going to go. And I had to start by telling every young faculty would have OR priority. Probably the only thing that kept me alive at that time is that I had absolute control of the operating room. So I had the greatest threat possible for any surgeon. I didn't have to say anything about um, you know, you don't have a great future here. Maybe you want to leave. I just had to say, you know, we've decided that um, your operating time will be changed and you're going to follow me on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that particular person said, but wait a minute, you don't finish till seven or eight every night. Yes, you understand the situation very clearly. And that person would leave. But there were a lot of versions like that. And, um, I was incredibly unfortunate. The young people, and particularly the young fellows, they kept me alive. And I was going to ask you. I mean, I'm sure for many leaders on this on this call, but for many, how did you deal with that? That I mean, how did you bring about that cultural change? Was it purity by 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 having by waiting for those who had different beliefs to be gone, or how did or were you able to change the minds of many? I think one of the reasons was I was incredibly naive. I got shot every day, but I didn't realize I was shot. And so that made people think that I was stronger than I was. But I couldn't believe some people could behave the way they did. So I said, well, they can't really mean that and ignored it. Uh, you do have to wait out some of the more senior people. Uh, but of course, you appoint people that you think think like you. I mean, the, the secret of every chairman's success is to always appoint people that are smarter than you. You just don't want them to know they're smarter than you. You have to give them two or three years and then they work out they are smarter than you, but it's too late. They've got a good job. Um, and I tried to do that. You and it's somewhere I, I read you talked about um, coming to work in the dark and leaving work in the dark, no matter what season it was, and the work ethic and so on. Well, I hope my children aren't listening to this, but yes, that's <laughs> absolutely true. I came to work in the dark and I went home in the dark, no matter what time of the year it was. I thought the sun came out on the weekends, usually after 12 noon on a Saturday. Um, but in truth, I loved every minute of it. So it's unfair to pretend that I had to work hard. Yeah, I probably had to work harder than others because I wasn't as smart as some of them, but they didn't know that at the time. But um, yes, I definitely thought that the sun came out on the weekends. Any advice uh, now that you look back one way or another about the work ethic and, 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 and any advice about that? Well, there's a couple of other senior people here would know. At, at the time that we were residents, that wasn't a choice. Remember, there were six or eight people standing in the wings happy to take your job. Um, and so it wasn't something we really seriously thought about. And then the converse, of course, if you want young people to work hard, you have to be willing to work as hard as they do. Now, they probably didn't know that I left the light on in my office to think that I was there later than I was, but who knows that? Yeah. <laughs> 
There's a question um, in the chat box uh, from a medical student that says, do you think that there comes a point in a surgeon's career where they must choose between being, in a, being an effective clinician and an effective scientist? Or can these two occur where you are still able to make a meaningful difference in the basic science world while operating? Okay, so you, you're asking two very complicated questions. First of all, no, I don't think a, an active clinical surgeon can him, he or herself be a basic investigator. And that's, un, that's not what happens anymore. We don't work in a vacuum. We all work with collaborators. And people act as if having a collaborator is a new thing. We always collaborated. Historically, though, we collaborated with radiologists and, and pathologists and others. So the short answer, if you want to do absolute basic science yourself at the bench, doing the work yourself, that's an extraordinarily hard to be a clinical surgeon in that environment. Conversely, if you want to be a very good surgeon, you don't get to be a good surgeon by not doing cases. But if you pick the right collaborator that you mutually uh, advantageous, then I think you can have an extraordinary rich uh, experience. Great. Your fo we, we talked in the, in the prep session a little bit about the focus on excellence and in, in, in your focus, whether prior to being chair at Memorial or while you were chair at Memorial or in the work you've done with college and other organizations. Any comments on that? How, how do you set um, the bar of excellence and, and how did you do it? And what, what did you learn from it? Well, I think that's very difficult. I mean, you're all familiar with the concept of 10,000 hours. And, and certainly in a lifetime, I did in excess of 10,000 cases. But the 10,000 hours are real. You can't be a good surgeon and not operate. You have less complications if you don't operate. But it, that's not what you're search, searching for. Um, I guess you rely on young people. If, remember, the young people are your conscience. If you're comfortable and you're comfortable with them challenging you or asking you a question, not pejoratively, and if you treat that question as serious, they, they enrich you. You, know, you don't learn much by talking. You learn a lot by listening. And if you can't explain to a young person a particular concept, then the answer is you don't understand it yourself. And I've seen myself do that. I've had a person ask me a question. Oh, I can tell you that and realize partway through my answer. I don't, I'm not doing this very well. And the reason I'm not doing it well is I don't know it well enough myself. So you have to stop and regroup. I don't know that that answered your question. No, no, no. And, and, and maybe, the, maybe I'll just elaborate a little bit as far as how do you set the bar for, for others or for the department you're leading or for the enterprise you're leading? Um, and how do you um, engage people and, and motivate people to, to rise to that level of excellence? Well, there's a positive and negative there. Obviously, you, you have to emphasize in quality. You have, your, your department has to reflect your focus on delivering the best possible care. The biggest mistake I think I may have made early on was you can never reward bad behavior. If there is bad behavior, whether it's a surgeon in the operating room or a relationship with another, if you don't confront that right then and there, it will come back to bite you. And it may be very unpleasant, but in some ways you fashion the quality and the emphasis on excellence by not rewarding poor behavior or inadequate performance. Oh, that, that, that really is, that resonates a, a lot. And, and that, that, that definitely answers the question very well. There's a question from audience that says, what's the secret to managing stress being a surgeon leader? Well, I don't know why I didn't get burned out. Some people would say I did, but I didn't really feel it. Now my family paid a, paid a high price for that. What I see right now is, and the emphasis is always on burnout. And I'll come back to that one minute. What I see now, though, is what has been described, I believe, as moral fatigue. And it's the vision that the physician, surgeon, son have been taught to deliver the best possible care. And suddenly, 
compliance, oversight, electronic medical record, all these things take away from that ability to deliver what you know is the right care. And that becomes moral fatigue, because if you think about it, you can knock 10 minutes off the operation, but you can't op knock two hours off the operation. If you have to do a whole lot of compliance and you're not allowed to get paid unless you do it, you've got to do that. So what happens, of course, is your relationship with the patient disappears because the one thing you can do is not answer the question or spend five minutes on rounds instead of 45 minutes. So the burnout for me, I think, was wrong. The, the way burnout was addressed for me was wrong because I, it never had that other side of the scale, the extraordinary rewards you were given, not necessarily monetary rewards. We were well paid. I don't deny that. But the idea that the privilege to look after someone is an amazing privilege. And then you get paid to do it. It always amazes me. You know, it's the, it's the lady who you didn't really help. It's, that's the family that comes back and gives you a gold pen. I mean, who gets rewarded for failing? And we even get rewarded for failing. So I think the burnout piece for me was counterbalanced by the extraordinarily relationships and rewards that people gave me. I mean, the kind of stuff we did was, it was serious surgery. These were some of the most courageous people I've ever met. <laughs> That's a gift. And that should be balanced against the stresses that you have. Now, and what would you say administratively, what were, what were the rewarding moments as a leader, not as a clinician, but as a leader? What were the things that would, may have been equivalent in, the, in that enjoyment? Never schedule a meeting more than 30 minutes. You're willing to continue beyond 30 minutes, but you don't tell them that at the start. And never have a meeting to set the agenda for the meeting. <laughs> That's not going to work. There are, I guess the major part of that is, of course, time management. And remember, that's one of the pleasures or great benefits of being a chairman. You can, we all have 24 hours in the day. Nobody has less or more. But it's what you do with the 24 hours. And if you have control of your time, you're in a very different position. Having said that, it's extraordinarily important to respect the time of others. If you say you're going to make rounds at 10 o'clock, you're allowed to be 10.04. Uh, if you don't respect the time demands on others, why should they respect the time demands on yours? So what were the, what were the benefits, I guess you ask me? Well, yeah. the benefits beyond the personal benefits uh, were seeing things that you believed in happen. Um, and most of those things were came about because we got to measure things. You know, what at the time I was getting started, databases didn't exist. Randomized controls, trials and surgery had certainly never been done at Memorial. But there are many people who have talked about unless you can measure something, you can't really change it. And so measuring things and pointing out to people, you may think, Remember, surgeons are interesting in that we remember the extraordinary successes and their extraordinary failures. In my generation, as a resident, we were all numerator doctors. There was no denominator. So putting denominator on your performance, just alone, without a randomized trial, makes a huge difference. When, you, when the senior surgeon says, I don't have complications, you say, yes, you do, and here they are, and they're exactly the same as mine. It's okay. A question uh, from our audience is, in your opinion, what are the defining characteristics of a surgeon leader? That's a difficult question. I guess that he or she is perceived as having a vision of some kind. It's not the vision of seeing the horizon. The horizon you know is there. There, it, it's the vision of knowing that between where you are and the horizon, there's a large amount of water there and there's a lot of sharks swimming in that water. But you do have a short-term vision. You very much know how you're going to get into the boat 
and how far that boat's going to take you before it gets swamped. The other thing that I think helped me most was you must be extraordinarily fair. Remember, there's a, there's a great debate about the differences in society. As a crude analysis of this country, you would say that we focus much more on freedom. If you focused on the New Zealand psyche, they would say we focus much more on fairness. And I think that is extraordinarily important. Most rewarding thing for me was to have a senior surgeon after I'd been here four or five years and had a very difficult time with another senior surgeon who I had to, I would say, request to leave, but really I had to push him out, uh, come to me and say, you know, we watched you uh, address this man that you didn't really respect and that you found extraordinarily frustrating and we were sure you wanted to kill him but you never did. You always treated him fairly. That gave me a credibility that was long-standing. And it was something I had not thought about until that person told me that. So the leader has to have a vision, but it's not a fixed vision. The leader has to be extraordinarily fair. Hopefully he has to be smart enough to only hire people smarter than himself. But as I said, don't tell them too soon. Um, what else? Admit your mistakes, of course, that's, that's crucial. And admit them right away, you know. Um, to, to pretend I didn't have disasters was absurd. Take responsibility. And in the same way that you would fix bad behavior, admit your own errors. I had the experience of arriving here, there'd be no mortality or morbidity. So I decided to start one. And the first one I had, no patients were presented except mine. And so, that went on for a couple of weeks and I said, wait a minute, what about all the other attending surgeons? Well, they instructed the fellows not to present their complications. And so my strategy for that, the evening before that meeting, I would walk around the floor, I'd write down everybody's temperature above 39.5 and then I would go to the next meeting and they would present my complications and then I'd say, well, what about Mrs. Murphy? 39.5. The senior surgeon says, oh, atelectasis. Well, seven days out and with a weight count of 25,000, probably not atelectasis. And then that was a way in which, without being too pejorative, you could get people to begin to think. And then, of course, you have the fellows be your conscience. You can ask me any question you want, politely. I won't necessarily answer about my personal life, but the rest of the questions are open. And they become your conscience. I want them to be my conscience. We have some really good questions. And I wanted to ask you one question that we did not leave this. How many years into your tenure did you feel that your vision was becoming more and more the reality of the department? I guess you should have to ask people that worked with me for that. Because I would say it varied between 10 minutes and 10 years, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the day. So um, uh, one question is, uh, how can one be better at delegation and avoiding micromanagement? Well, that's like saying, how can you be a good politician? And the only way you can be a good politician and ignore politics is to understand them. So you have to understand them first, then you can ignore them. Uh, delegation. Um, well, I did have a phrase as I gave someone a task. I, I would say, you know, I understand if you tell me I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I won't do it. What I cannot tolerate is if you tell me you will do it and you don't do it. That is a big sin and mm -hmm. there is a price for that sin. So I think the delegation piece is, is often one that you test out. You quickly learn who you can delegate to. And it's usually the busy person, not the non-busy, lazy person. But again, don't reward bad behavior. That helps. Delegate to people who are going to get it done. The best form of delegation is when you're delegating something to someone that you know they want to get done. So early on, delegate things that you know the actual person wants. And then when you get to delegate something that you 
no, they don't want to do, by then it's too late. They've already agreed to do the things they wanted to do in the first place. Excellent. Uh, there's a one one note of thanking you for everything you've given to many of us. Dr. Lefemina Femina is, is saying thank you for everything you've given to us. Um, another question is what I is believe your... that young lady was present the year that seven out of eight of our fellows were women. Maybe it was only six out of seven, but thank you anyway. <laughs> The, and they were there because they were the best candidates for no other reason. They were the best candidates. One question is, um, what is your assessment of the changes in surgical education from work hour regulations, changes in autonomy, uh, specialization, over-specialization, and their impact on the future generations of surgeons? That's a textbook you just asked me to write. Yes, I know. <laughs> Um, times are different. It's okay. It's okay to have a life. It's okay to adjust to having people that get to have a real life that they enjoy. I actually, apologies if my kids are listening, I don't think I would change anything because I wouldn't know how to. You know, I had a serious injury. I lost one of the fingers in my hand. I had a reattachment. I got a reflex dystrophy. I told everyone the moment the pain goes away, I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to go home at four o'clock in the afternoon. And the moment I had the amputation and the pain went away, I was just as pathological as before. Do you feel that you would have done the same in any career or was the medical career something different about it? Or was that something in you that, that would have done the same if you were in another business line of work? I would like to think so. I set out to be an engineer and my father wanted me to be an engineer. And I decided I didn't want to do that. I was going to go to medical school. And the smartest thing I did because I had a year in a pure and applied maths and physics. During medical school, I got a maths degree. You had to skip some classes, but if you did pure and applied maths, you could get a maths degree without any labs. And so you could skip a few classes. That gave me my first introduction to the numerator denominator problem. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a very unknowingly smart thing to do. There's a question that says, uh, how did you manage your time as a chair? As you said, you need to have control of time. So in, in view of the fact that you did have control of your time, how did you decide to, to, to divide and, multi and, and deal with the different tasks? Well, I can tell you what I did in a week. Uh, Monday, I began Monday morning with the lab meeting and uh, most of Monday was devoted, certainly early on, purely to the lab. Uh, Tuesday, I operated all day. But of course, in those days, we had two rooms, two fellows. Uh, Wednesday was a education and um, administrative day. And Thursday was operate all day. And Friday was see patients all day. Uh, and the nights were for cleaning up the pieces around that. And unfortunately, the weekends usually were when your grants got written because you can't write a grant an hour a night. You have to do it. And the other thing, when my children were young on a Saturday, I would just get up extraordinarily early, come into the hospital, work, make rounds, and be back before they got out of bed as teenagers. Yeah. The question uh, that's being asked is, when do you know it's time to walk away from it all? Retire slowly, like stop operating first, oh. but still do teaching, researching, or just stop everything? I've I recently been asked that. And I actually wrote about that. So first of all, the attitude I had towards the staff was that you must understand that you must stop operating two years before I tell you to. Because if I have to tell you to, then you're no longer working here. Now, that was a threat. But it was a problem with the threat, it usually worked actually, was I got to where I thought I was two years away from it. So that was a real problem I had to. And the way I solved that was by writing down, I will step down as chair at 65, I will stop operating at 70. And I wrote it down and gave it that so that I couldn't, couldn't avoid it. What we know for sure is that we have cognitive decline with time. That, that's a given. 
and both Blazer Greenfield and other studies have shown that very clearly. What is also true, however, that if you do complicated surgical procedures, the only way to overcome that uh, cognitive decline is to keep the volume of what you do up. So at the crucial time, if you want to be a very good and do a lot of complicated surgery at the age of 65 or 68, you have to do a lot of it. The idea that you can slowly retire is nonsense if you're going to do complicated surgery. If you're going to do breast biopsies and thyroidectomy, perhaps you can go on for a very long time, but you cannot, you cannot retire gracefully. I actually tried it uh, when I decided to stop. And I said, well, I was going to see patients for six months after I stopped operating. I lasted, I think, to the end of January. I, everyone came in who liked you and said, well, well, you're wonderful and you saved my life. Or someone came in who had a problem that you would like to have fixed, but you couldn't. I was not the person to become a second assistant. Some people can do that remarkably well. I think I was a good assistant, but only if I was in charge of the case. So there are different ways in which you can exit. I don't think and, I... And you mentioned... Um, so after you stopped operating and stopped seeing patients, what has given, um, how have you chosen to spread your time in retirement? Well, the problem, you have to be sure, as Steve Rosenberg says, that retirement never gets in the way of your work. Um, what I did was, because I stopped, stepped down as chairman at 66 and I stopped operating at 71, but I had five of the greatest years I ever had. I was not the chairman. I still had a busy practice. I had wonderful young people that I could spend time with, but I also had time to reinvent myself in the international sphere. And I spent a lot of time doing that so that I would be able to take over all of the international programs. And I did go to India and China and the Middle East and look at all these things so that I would be knowledgeable in a new, in a new role. I couldn't have done that if I was right at chairman. <laughs> There's a comment that says, um, uh, thank you for this uh, talk tonight. The surgeon scientist is considered an endangered species. What are some suggestions you have for promoting the surgeon scientist pathway? Collaboration. Find a colleague, work with them, bring to him or her something you don't have. Take their advantage. Now, remember, the surgeon scientist is not lost. The Many of the surgeons would be well advised, I think, to embrace um, informatics. I mean, the availability of uh, genetic material, that does not require that you work in a basic science lab. That requires that you understand the meaning of this extraordinary amount of data that we're doing. So I think an opportunity for what I would see as a surgeon scientist is to embrace the technology, which is, is now a core facility in most institutions, and learn how you could use that, and then make sense of what you see. Because only the person delivering the care can make sense of what you see. You've, you've uh, alluded to the fellows that you've trained. Surgical education, the meaning in your career and your time, where did it st stand? Well, it's a different time, I think. Yeah. Um, COVID is being very stressful in, in so many ways. You, you no longer get to know young people. You don't sit down and uh, discuss things with them. You don't have an evening where you talk to them about wine. You don't have a chance to do that. I mean, you just don't. Um, and they have different priorities. That's okay. They're still just as intelligent and hardworking as anyone. And what did, what did watching people that you had trained uh, achieve great things in the future, how, what did that mean to you and, and where did that sit in the, in the kind of the, what gave your uh, career meaning? Oh, that's by far and away the most rewarding thing I've done. Far, far away. If you have a legacy at all, it's who you influenced, whom you helped educate, whom you helped promote it. And I want to read this because it's a touching uh, statement. It says, I don't know if the professor remembers an online link up between MSK 
and the Otago School of Medicine when he had almost uh, when he almost uh, when he had almost all female um, fellows. Um, and there was only one woman on the New Zealand and sitting in a sea of men. I'm that woman and I'm still here. And Professor's encouragement to me on that day was incredibly impactful. What can I do I, but say thank you? I wanted to share that. Well, I Another appreciate book. that. Please, please give that person my email. I'll say I, I think, you again. And, and, and Susan, Susan, maybe we can make that happen. And Stephen, thank you. Um, yeah, there's another question that says, would you mind sharing a little bit about your approach to being a lifelong learner, both in and out of surgery? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm already, one of the tragedies is that I'm not learning enough to replace what I'm forgetting. I mean, it, it's frightening. Yeah. Remember, remember, the ability to say, I do not know, is perfectly okay if you've done your homework, but it's not okay if you haven't done your homework. So lifelong learning, mm. I guess, make, make your young colleagues keep you thinking, make, accept their questions. Why did you do that? What difference does it make? And it's never confrontational. It's never, never pejorative. There's no point in kicking the dead horse or hitting someone who's down, that just doesn't work. You don't have to agree with everyone, but there's no joy in hurting someone else. Absolutely. That's in, in um, another question is, um, how can one develop a sense of equanim equanimity, um, especially when things go wrong? Does it simply come over time with dealing with complications or is there a way to cultivate it? Well, I think you might start, and everyone on this entire panel should start, with the fact that they are extraordinarily privileged. Remember, not a single one of us had anything to do with where we were born or to whom we were born. That was an accident that you had nothing to do with. And we should be extraordinarily grateful for that. You know, you could have been born in Ethiopia and dead by Friday. I mean, first of all, recognize Perhaps the best analogy I could give would be, historically, I've been known to say when someone was taking themselves a little too seriously, do you realize there's 1.5 billion Chinese who don't even know your name? Uh, be extraordinarily grateful for that. I mean, who else got rewarded for looking after another human being? But more importantly, it was an accident. It was the accident you had nothing to do with. And to the question that's being asked a little bit, does that come, did that, was there a time that you can identify that, that this sense came to you or was that there when you were, let's say 35 or 40 or did it come at, over time or at a certain time that you can identify where this suddenly clicked? Well, it certainly reinforced every day, but I think the, I, uh, Satch would know, but I wrote a piece about winning the lottery and it was winning the birthing lottery. And I wrote a thing about caring. Isn't that why you went to medical school? I believe that stuff. The challenge is, can we still do it? When you chisel into the time that is the most rewarding, when you can no longer sit at the bedside, grasp the patient, do you mind if I hold your hand and the patient squeezes your hand in gratitude or fear? That's a reward that no one else gets. It, the, there's a question that relates to the comment I think you made before. It says, do you believe a tradi the traditional notion that surgeons must be strong, go-getters, determined, authoritative? I think it's, it helps, to, certainly helps to be strong. Uh, it certainly helps to be authoritative if you've done your homework and you're fair and you're straight. Go-getter is a kind of a word I'd rather not indulge in. Most of the go-getters are going to get something for, your, for themselves as opposed to going to get something that's important. The bigger vision is more important than my vision or my, what I want. We have 10 minutes left and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about, uh, as I see the vineyard behind you, 
um, family and where, where your thoughts about your life with your family and where that's it stood in your life and so on? Well, I, I certainly didn't do it perfectly by any, any means. Um, I guess we should go back to the far side so I don't have to worry about it. Um, all I can say about that is you make choices. And I was extraordinarily fortunate. I was certainly not there for every baseball game. I'm not proud of that. I tried to be there for things that mattered, but I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't be any good if I walked. Well, here's, here's an example. We used to, uh, the patient's families used to sit in the front lobby of our institution. And I had two choices to go to get my car. I could walk out the front door or I could go down the basement and avoid them. And I did the basement thing a couple of times and then all I did was be unhappy all the way home because I didn't. Want. And so I would call and say, I'll be home in an hour. And my family quickly got to learn that meant too. And I would go through the, the lobby and, and talk to the patients. Um, I'm extraordinarily fortunate because it all could have gone wrong um, in that my current relationship with my adult children is terrific. I'm grateful I can't go and see them because they're sitting in another country that won't let me in, but that's okay. Um, I guess I'd paraphrase it with, we all make choices. It, it took me a long time to work out that actually you're not much help to anyone if you haven't solved your own problems. You create your own happiness. No one else is responsible for that. And you create your own grief and you take responsible for it. I'm not proud of a lot of things I did one of the smartest things I did, I guess, uh, was that when I left the country, I invariably took a child with me. If mm -hmm. I went, I've been, I showed up at one time at the American Surgical Association for their black tie dinner with my young, my daughter. And that when I got on the elevator, someone looked at me, uh-oh, Murray's showing up with a new girlfriend. And the the relief when I pointed out, would you like to meet my daughter was palpable. <laughs> but I left the country. I would go to give a talk in Rome and take one of my kids for two days. What, what that taught me was that that was time I, and they set a, a rule. They said, okay, here's the deal. If we travel with you, you cannot open your briefcase if we are awake. And that was a fabulous guideline. That probably salvaged my relationship. Did so you I, live by that guideline? Yeah, yeah. But I, as soon as they were asleep, I opened my briefcase. Yes. <laughs> I want to ask, uh, and, and I see a comment that says, uh, so grateful for you and your inspiration, Dr. Brennan. Um, you know, we think about meaning in life. And you've talked obviously a lot about patient care and the, the fact that that gave you meaning and surgical education. But throughout your career, how did you find meaning and did it change through the years of your career? Did, did, did how, what gave you meaning on a daily basis change or was it fairly static? Uh, I think it was reasonably static. I mean, meaning was feeling at the end of the day, there was still a lot more that you could do, but there was a lot more that you'd got done. I mentioned very early on, I, I, I don't do the mea culpa very well. I, I look back and think, you know, yesterday was for learning. It wasn't for changing. And tomorrow hadn't come yet. So I think doing the pretty much the best you can each day, feeling, I think it's very important to always feel, uh, the status quo is not good enough without the mea culpa. In other words, just recognize that you could have done it better, but you're not going to punish yourself. Uh, you're not going to self-flagellate. That doesn't work, in my opinion. 
Um, I want to leave with two quick questions. One is any final pieces of advice for all the people who've joined. And thank you for all the comments and questions from everyone. The second, the, the, but the other question I have is any thoughts about what, what reassures you about the direction of surgery in America and what worries you about the direction of surgery in America? Well, I'm clearly biased, but... Uh... In our institution, the best doctors in the hospital are the surgical fellows. No question, doubt about it. They're willing to take responsibility from diagnosis to demise. They're willing to be there. So I'm optimistic. Plus, remember, surgeons like to lead. In every operation, we make decisions on inadequate information, but we make the decision. It's not a choice to say, oh, I don't know what to do now. I'll just put in a zipper and come back tomorrow. That's not how it works. So I think the opportunity to look after the cancer patient has never been more available to people who are willing to take responsibility. It's hard. Looking after cancer patients is hard. I understand that. But if you think about what's wrong with American medicine, as you ask 90% of patients, who's your doctor? And they'll say, which one do you want? So the opportunities, I think, remain. And they're just as smart and just as hardworking. They have different priorities. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And before I leave with your final comments, we have not had any panelists, I don't believe, who've been a knight. And I wanted to ask what that has meant to you, um, the knighthood. Oh, well, I'm obviously flattered to do that. The, the complexities, you understand that um, the Queen can give an honorary knighthood to a non-Commonwealth citizen, like um, Ronald Reagan had a knighthood, but they can't use the title sir. And so I had to renew my New Zealand passport. I didn't tell anyone that I'd let it expire, but fortunately, by doing so, that allows me to accept it. And so then the fellows say, well, now that you've got this knighthood, do we have to call you sir? And my answer invariably was, you always did call me, sir. And nothing has changed. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you for your final thoughts and, and any final advice that you would like to give all of us. Um, and, and there are all notes of thank you, thanks in the in the chat. So, so um, any final words uh, for the I, for the participant? I, I don't want to give anyone advice. Uh, I, I think I want to reaffirm that everyone on this call should understand, no matter all the difficulties they've had, how extraordinarily privileged they have been and are to be where they are doing what they're doing. You know, I thought my life was over when I had my hand in tree, but that was just a bump in the road. I, I just think, I don't know, how do I say that I've been so fortunate? How do I apologize that I, wasn't a better, perhaps, father. How do I apologize that on some days I wasn't a better surgeon? I mean, it didn't help. The mayor culpas don't work. Sorry for those who believe in mayor culpa. Thank you so very much. I'm going to leave the last word to Dr. Satshiva, but Dr. Brennan, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor, and thank you to all the participants. We've had an amazing amount of engagement tonight. Thank you, Dr. Satshiva. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brennan, for all the practical wisdom, and you truly are a revered leader and a role model for all of us and uh, a great mentor of mentors. And thanks so much for all that you do for the Academy each day. And thank you, Dr. Shabahang, again, for contributing so much to the Academy as a member and for your wonderful uh, uh, moderation of this session. and. Uh, sharing all the sessions that you do for us for these evening webinars. And um, thank you all for being here. This has been an I absolute I uh, want to say one, number of attendees. Uh, uh, Dr. Brendan, would you like I, to say? I want to say one other thing that I'd like to put on my CV, if it's okay. I got Satch Diva to take off his jacket. <laughs> that, it, this is being recorded so it'll be on the record <laughs> sorry <laughs> i can promise you the moment that we sign off his jacket will go back on <laughs> and thank you all for being here it's been a lovely uh, evening afternoon morning wherever you are 
And uh, this is an absolute banner evening with a record number of attendees. So thank you all for taking the time and have an enjoyable rest of the day, evening or night. So thank you again. And thanks. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rich.